In this video, I will show you how to process streaming data with Upsolver using data coming in from Kafka and outputting it to Snowflake. We will read from two topics in Kafka, stage them in the data lake, join them in real time, and then store the joined output in Snowflake. Upsolver is a managed service that makes it easy, fast, and safe to move data between source systems and your data warehouse or data lake. Upsolver provides powerful observability features to catch data and schema issues before they create problems downstream. For this example, we'll take two Kafka topics, process them using Upsolver, and load the result into Snowflake. These steps guarantee exactly one semantics and strongly ordered data as we ingest into the target. We need to do a few things to process streaming data with Upsolver. First, we need to create and configure a connection to your Kafka cluster. Second, we need to create table definitions in Upsolver to stage the Kafka topics in the data lake. This will define the columns and data types. Third, we need to create jobs that ingest the data from the Kafka topics into Upsolver Managed Data Lake. That gets the data ready for joining. Fourth, we'll create a materialized view. This is how Upsolver will do the lookup to join the two tables. Fifth, we need to create another table definition for the resulting join data. Sixth, we need to create the job that does the join. This job will define how the tables are joined together. Seventh, we need to create a table definition in our destination system. In this video, we'll show how to do this in Snowflake. Finally, we must create a job that joins and copies the data from Upsolver to our destination system. We'll go through the exact steps in just a second, but I want to show you how to run your queries in Upsolver first. This is Upsolver's web interface. You can start using Upsolver right now for free with the developer sandbox. It has templates for various use cases, including the SQL queries we'll cover in this video. You can get there by going to https colon forward slash forward slash sqlake.upsolver.com. At the SQL prompt, we can type in our query. You'll notice that Upsolver gives us nice syntax highlighting and even code completion using control plus spacebar. I'll click on execute. SQL statements are separated by a semicolon. Make sure that our cursor is on the line of the statement that we want to execute. You can use the keyboard by pressing Control plus Enter. Our first step is to create a connection to the Kafka cluster. A connection to Kafka allows us to access data delivered to any topic via Upsolver. If you need to restrict access to specific topics, you'll need to configure your Kafka access controls accordingly. You'll notice there are a few consumer properties we need to add. This information gives the login, broker DNS, and other configuration properties. You can connect Upsolver to any Kafka-compatible service like Confluent, AWS MSK, and Red Panda. In this video, I'll show you how to get this information from and connect to Confluent Cloud. Go to Confluent Cloud and navigate to the clients. Then click on Consumers, click on New Client. In the list of languages, choose Java. Scroll down to see a text box with the client configuration. Copy the text box's contents and save it in a text file for use later. Take the DNS of the bootstrap underscore servers and replace the Upsolver example SQL queries host and the first entry in the consumer underscore properties. Click on create Kafka cluster API key. The key will be your username and the secret will be your password. Click on download and continue. In the Upsolver example SQL query, replace the username with a key and the password with a secret. The other properties in the example SQL query shouldn't need to be updated. We need a program that feeds data into Kafka for us to ingest into Upsolver. Depending on your situation, you must connect to your own Kafka cluster with data already flowing into topics. For those that don't have data or just want to try things out, I've written a program that randomly generates feasible data. The data can be output to Kafka or saved as text files. First, you need to clone the repository from GitHub. 
Next, replace the client.properties file with the information you saved from Confluent Cloud. Don't forget to replace the username and password with the key and secret, respectively. Start the data generator with the Maven command shown. It will publish a certain number of messages in exit. In this example, it will publish 100,000 messages to Kafka in JSON format and exit. In the Confluent Cloud UI, you will need to create two topics. One topic is named Apache underscore log underscore JSON, and the other is user underscore info underscore JSON. One partition is sufficient for each of the topics. The instructions for other Kafka offerings will differ, but the general idea should still apply. You must create access credentials, create topics, and allow outside access to the broker. Back in Upsolver, we have our connection created, and now we need to create our staging tables. The table creation gives the column names and types that Upsolver will expect to find in the Kafka topics. You can also configure Upsolver to use the Kafka schema registry, but we'll skip that step here. As you can see, we have to repeat each query for each topic we're working with. There is a table create for the RT underscore web underscore traffic underscore data and another table for RT underscore user underscore data. We will let Upsolver figure out the column information for the RT underscore user underscore data table. We're creating these tables to be able to stage the raw events in the data lake. This table is powerful because it gives us almost infinite retention and replay capability. We no longer need to depend on the source Kafka cluster retention, which frequently is only a few days. We can also query and reprocess these raw events as they are updated in real time without impacting our production Kafka. We click on Next. A new tab is created letting us know the task is done. We're missing two critical pieces of information, the Kafka topic name and where to begin consuming the topic from. We accomplish this by specifying a job. A job in Upsolver is responsible for moving data from the source into Upsolver for more processing. This job will continue to run in the background and ingest all of the incoming data for the topic as new events are published. Please note that you may need to wait a few minutes for the job to start populating data. We can query the data now that we have created our table and job. If you're already familiar with SQL syntax, this query will look very familiar. This syntax familiarity is designed so that users with SQL skills can start using Upsolver immediately. A DevOps or data engineer can create the connections and staging tables to make it even easier for users to implement business use cases with these datasets. I like to run a select query after creating a table to ensure everything works correctly and the data returns as expected. When I click on execute, the query was submitted to Upsolver. The results are displayed in a tab at the bottom. Now, we can view the query results and ensure everything is what we're expecting. I take a quick look to ensure all of the types and column names match up. We'd use a regular select query to peek at the data as we did. We'd often use them for a quick discovery or verifying that a table we create works as expected. Upsolver has another built-in sanity check for data. Let's also open up the table profile page and take a quick look at the data distribution to ensure it looks correct. We can see from the chart that data is coming in. Field statistic gives us a way to verify our data quality. Now we're getting into the advanced features of Upsolver. A materialized view is Upsolver's way of doing lookups for the latest data of a table based on a primary key. In this case, we're creating a materialized view to look up records for the user underscore data table, which are grouped by the user ID. You'll see later in the join syntax, but the user ID is the field on which we'll join the two tables. The next part of the query defines the select statement, configuring how the data will be laid out. You can see the last function being used. Materialized views are updated as new data is added. For example, if our user changes our address, we want our materialized view to update its data too. The last function returns the last value of the address or whichever column that arrived for that group. 
The group is defined by the group by clause. You can see the group by is on the user ID since that is the unique key we'll be joining on. Other functions are being used. The address field didn't split out the zip or postal code in the source data. Using a combination of functions, we'll pull out the zip code. In this case, the zip code is the last field and is separated by space characters. We split the field out on the space character using the split function. With the last element function, we choose the last item in the array created by the split function. The MD5 function creates a hash of the input. We'll create hashes of the password and credit card number so they are masked in the output. We need to create another table. This table will contain the results of the joined data from the user underscore data and the web underscore traffic underscore data tables. The columns and types match those of the source table. We also define the primary key as our user ID. In this walkthrough, we create a job that joins two data sets, writes out the join table, and another job writes the results to Snowflake. Alternatively, we can create a single job that will write the joined results directly to Snowflake, eliminating the join table written to AWS. Having a join table written out is useful if you want to perform ad hoc analysis, validate data quality, or just integrate this data into a different use case. We create another job to join the data. You'll notice that this job is more involved than the previous jobs we've created. This is because the job has to define the select statement that defines how data will be laid out for the resulting table. Since we've created our join table definition to match the source tables, the columns are restatements of the names. We must add an alias for each column so UpSolver knows the name we want to use. At the end of the query is where the exciting parts are. The web underscore traffic underscore data table is joined to the materialized view of the user data and not the original table. This is because UpSolver uses the materialized view as a lookup table for the latest user data information. You can see the column we're joining on is the user ID column. Finally, the WHERE clause stipulates that we should only look at the data that has changed since the last run of the job. Our goal is to write the results of the joined data sets into Snowflake. To do this, we must add some things in UpSolver and Snowflake. Let's start with UpSolver. In UpSolver, we need to create a Snowflake connection. You'll need to update your URL to correspond with the URL of your Snowflake cluster. In this example, the URL is in the AWS US East 1 environment. You'll notice that we need our username and password credentials to access the Snowflake cluster. We need to go to our Snowflake environment for our next SQL query. With this query, we create a table in Snowflake where UpSolver inserts the data. You'll notice that this table create matches the staging table definition in UpSolver. In a more advanced use case, we would transform the data with UpSolver and save the converted data in Snowflake. This would imply creating a different table definition in Snowflake that represents the schema resulting from the transformation. For example, we could exclude specific columns or add computed columns. We click on Run to execute the query. Back in UpSolver, we need to create another job that moves the joined data from UpSolver into Snowflake. We start by configuring how often to run the job and where to start from. Then we specify which Snowflake connection to use and where to insert the data in Snowflake. Next, we create a select statement that projects which column will be included in the output. Finally, we add a WHERE clause that UpSolver needs to copy just the data that has changed since the last run of the job. We'll click on Run to start the job. We finished all of the piping and connections to get our joined data into Snowflake. The jobs are running, processing data, and copying it. We can see the results by returning to Snowflake and running a select query. It may take a few minutes for data to start populating in Snowflake, this query will be a sanity check that all of our data is moving correctly and to the right places. As we can see, everything is working perfectly for us. 
What should you do if you don't see data after a while? Chances are there's a problem with the SQL queries. We can use the Jobs tab to see what's happening in Upsolver with our jobs. In this view, we can see all of the jobs we've configured in Upsolver. This view gives us a brief overview of each job running on the cluster. We can click on a job to provide a more detailed view of the job. With the job pulled up, you can see the information about the job. In this example, we've added a new field to the table. We can go to the table information screen to get more information about the new column. Upsolver has recognized this addition and we can take any necessary actions such as verifying the column or checking the Kafka topic. This video showed you how to create a streaming ingestion pipeline and a more advanced pipeline that joins data in Upsolver and writes the output into Snowflake. I invite you to run the code for yourself using Upsolver and the template we created that contains all of the code we covered in this video. If you want to go deeper, please watch the other videos covering more advanced use cases such as making batch data pipelines. Thanks for watching.